when you think of the word purpose, what do you connect it with? Do you connect it with your career? Do you connect it with your personal life? Or do you connect it to a mixture of both? I think this is something I've been thinking a lot about lately is when I look at purpose, I often just associated the word with my career, with my job aspirations, you know, the work that I was doing. But I've started to shift that tremendously to think about how it connects to my personal life, to my my children, to the impact that I want to have as a dad, not only as an educator. In this conversation with Dr. Derek Love, we talk about purpose. We talk about the importance of kind of finding what that is and, and how it connects to your work. But we also talk about the importance of building trust in our schools and how it can actually lead to improved performance of not only your students, but obviously your educators as well. Because if you want your kids to do better, you got to ensure that you're doing everything to set up your teachers for success. It's a great conversation. I love having this chat with Dr. Derek. I hope you enjoy it as well. Hey everyone, this is George Kuros with another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I'm very lucky to have Dr. Derek Love on the podcast today. And him and I have been talking before. He's got a really great story. He's got a new book out and just kind of interesting to listen to all of his experiences, how he's kind of been dealing with his school, uh, with his staff in, you know, dealing with 2020, the, the perception of how we deal with these things is, is really powerful. So Dr. Derek, thank you so much for spending time with me, uh, you know, taking time out of your busy day to join the podcast. Can you just tell people a little bit about who you are and just kind of your journey in education? Absolutely. Let me tell you, George, I'm, I'm first and foremost, first and foremost, grateful and humbled to be a part of your podcast today. Uh, my journey in education has been a rewarding one for the past 19 years. And I started out as an elementary teacher, uh, believe it or not, in um, Fort Worth, um, I, Fort Worth Independent School District, and which was the launching of my career in education, but the best foundational year as well, too. Um, I remember that experience, um, all of the students came from a, a one adjacent housing project. No kids were bust in, they all came from that one housing project. And if you can imagine this on your first day, I came in, I was a PE teacher though, so, and I came in and so the kids were chanting, we won't coach Terry, we won't coach Terry. That's awesome. So here it is, this <laughs> new teacher coming in, not as that into an inner city, inner city school, uh, just kind of whirlwind and shocked at the same time that these kids were doing that. But it taught me a life lesson that we have to earn kids respect all, always. And so um, it's not always just granted, but you got to earn it and also be able to genuinely give in both areas uh, from a student's perspective and teacher perspective. But from there, moved on to um, assistant principal, principal, uh, from principal to chief academic officer, deputy superintendent to where I'm currently now, uh, assistant superintendent and executive regional director. So I've had 18, 19 years in education in K-12, but also serving in higher education as well too um, for the past 11 years and now serving at Grand Canyon University as a senior dissertation adjunct chair. So that's kind of been my journey in K-12 and K-16, I would say. When you, when you got to that school, the kids were cheering for you, right? Like they wanted... No, they were cheering <laughs> for the old PE teacher. Oh. Yes. So they were cheering. Oh, no. <laughs> so they were cheering. Oh, no. Yeah. So you imagine I walk into a, a, a about 65th graders, I mean, about 45 fifth graders <laughs> chanting, we won't coach Terry. And I'm looking like, but I'm Coach Love. And that's two different names. So here it is. Yeah. And so that's what I was like. It was an experience for more than any other, but I learned so much from that experience. And that's all I'm talking about the respect factor. Sometimes you, you walk in, it's supposed to be just, you know, given to you. Mm-mm. I had to earn it, work for it and sustain it. <laughs> I wonder, you know, I wonder in some situations, I'm sure, you know, cause you said you, you've been an administrator, you know, I bet you some teachers would probably say that about their old principal sometimes too. Right? They, right. If they could chant out loud, they might do that as well. They just, you know, they're too worried about getting a job. 
Uh, yeah. That's quite that's so okay. So if that happens, right? So that happens at the beginning. And this uh-huh. this you're just when you started teaching? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was my first year in public education. Oh my oh that's, that's so nice. when I walked in, so here it is. So now you gotta remember now too. I came through an an alternative <laughs> program, teacher program. So I didn't go the traditional route, went to four yeah. years of undergrad to get yeah. to become a teacher. And so I went the alternative certification route. And so, you know, I wasn't, I, I don't, and matter of fact, they don't do it in in, in traditional uh, uh, teacher preparation programs anyway. But you're not, you know, you don't, that's not something they teach you. Like you're going to come out to a group of kids and they're going to be chanting and you got to be able to navigate that pathway and how what to pivot. To, what, what to do if. <laughs> what to do if. <laughs> That's amazing. Right. That, yeah, that don't give you those type of scenarios. What to do <laughs> if. Uh, so I had to weather the storm, brother, and I weathered the storm. I had to, uh, you know, in that moment, take command of the classroom, calm that classroom down, calm my well, gym down, calm that down, and begin to educate because. Um, it was, like I said, an inner city, I, mostly of African-Americans and Hispanic students. And, uh, but it, like I said, it was the most rewarding experience of my life, though. So, so over, okay, so over time, because like, I think, you know, this is, over time, you think about that, like, how did you get those kids? Like, I wonder when you left, if they were like cheering for you out. <laughs> Right. <laughs> you know, like I maybe you know, it would be horrible to happen on your first day, but when you leave, you'd be like, right. oh, quite a nice I you know, I want the kids to miss me too, right? So like how did you right. you know, how did you go through that year to like you know, how did they change what did you do to get their them to change their perceptions of you? So to change their perceptions of me, there was um a lot of extending myself as a teacher, like you know. That was going into the into the the apartment complex, the uh, low income apartment com- complexes, and introducing myself and mm-hmm. meeting the parents, and um, that included me um, staying after school and being a part of the tutorial program. Just kind of being more actively engaged in their day to day than just that um, classroom teacher or that fifty minutes that I had before uh, in P- in physical education. So. Um, I did the after school program, got a chance to know parents and things like that. So once I get began to kind of make inroads and then making my um, getting to know the students as well, too, and building those relationships and rapport was very helpful. And then, you know, in teaching, you only it's like in like, you know, amongst any classroom, you got the two ones that's going to act out the most. You get them too. <laughs> hey, you get the rest of them. <laughs> my first year teaching. So. And then winning them. And so in the end, we won each other um, in that storyline. We won each other. And uh, man, it was just like I said, uh, they grew. I grew immensely as a teacher on what to do, how to do. And you know that what if and the three dots, if, da, 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 what if now, what do you do? How to pivot as a teacher as well, too. Yeah, and I actually like just thinking about that just having that experience where the kids maybe weren't excited to have you, you know, um, Mm -hmm. at the beginning of your career. I think a lot of times we don't appreciate how much that actually helps to shape us as educators that sometimes Mm -hmm. when we have a tough class or tough students, or to be honest, you as an administrator, uh, tough teachers, like, if, you, if we're mm-hmm. being truly honest, and I'm sure superintendents could say, you know, a tough principal, that you learn a mm-hmm. lot from those experiences as well. Sometimes it's, you know, how do you navigate some of these things? How do you actually maybe uh, people are struggling with some other things that they're not sharing with you in that moment? How do you, you know, control what you can control? And that, that to me, like, I, I'm just, as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking about like one school that I went to uh, and they weren't excited about seeing me, right? They, uh, they had a mm-hmm. teacher that they loved uh, going there. And, and the reason why I thought about it is because one of the kids that struggled the most in the class uh, told me, this is, I've been teaching for, I think, maybe six or seven years at this point. And he told me, F right. you, first day. And I mm-hmm. never had a student say that to me ever. And like, yeah. I just never had dealt with that. I was like, how is this a thing? Like, this is actually true. Like this, I thought this just happens maybe on TV. <laughs> I didn't think right. it actually happened in school. <laughs> right. 
And uh, I, I took it really personally. I remember that right. first. And that kid and I really became close by the end of the year. But I like, I, I like, if we're being honest, I didn't want to be around. I was like, I don't want this kid in my class. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think it really, it took me kind of changing my perception of that student at that time, because nobody wants to be right. respected even by, you know, a young kid um, yeah. at the time, but that kid had, that kid didn't have any issue with me. And I think that's something I realize is, you know, there's something else that's going on that time. But I, like when I'm listening to you in that first year, the, that's a, that's a horrible thing. And I think about, I don't know how I would have dealt with that. Cause I was crying my entire first year anyway. <laughs> I, never had, I, mean, they were ne I never had anything like that. I was like, Oh, I'm going to quit. So good for you. Yeah. Right. So, Hey, when you look at your, when you look at your career and you've had so many different roles um, and you look back at that, like when you, for example, were assistant principal and a principal, and we talked about this a little bit on the other podcast um, that we just recorded talking about like, what advice would you give yourself as like a first year teacher? Um, because we've all had that experience, you know, in education, mm -hmm. but if you can go back now that you're not in the administrator role, like in the principal uh, or mm -hmm. assistant principal role, like what's something that you would actually look back and say like, Hey, this is what I would have told myself to do at this time. Now that I've kind of got like a, a step back view, what, what advice would you give yourself? One of the advices I would give myself would be uh, learn how to communicate uh, really effectively. Um, and what I mean by that is generationally, because when I came into administration, like I said, at 27, you know, I was young and fresh, but how I communicated didn't maybe sit well with the baby boomer or the gen, you know what I'm saying? So knowing how to communicate with the various people on the staff, because they, they communicate um, how you communicate is differently to them. Um, so for the baby boomer, for the Gen X, the Gen Y, the, all those different generational categories is knowing how to communicate to get the best result. And sometimes I would speak, you know, my way. And then the last thing, thing I would say is, you know, my way is not always the best way. Mm -hmm. um, and being able to, at 27, hear diversity of thought and work to... Uh, hear everyone's input and buy-in and then work to a greater resolution and resolve that was something great for kids and knowing that everybody is a champion and uh, and in that championship piece giving people the equal opportunity to be a part of it so that's what I would tell my 27 28 year old self uh, when I came into administration yeah and that's like I, I think when you talk about the notion of diversity of thought, I think that's something that's really important because we have our own perspectives. We have our own experiences um, in what we do. And I think a lot of times, and this is something I've, I've seen in the past is that, you know, as administrators, I've seen people hire basically clones of themselves. So if you're the principal, you hire like a clone assistant principal that kind of thinks like mm -hmm. you that says the same stuff as you and all these other things. And I feel that not only does that not help you grow as an organization, but I also feel it kind of disenfranchises like a, a, maybe a group of people that would rather talk to the assistant principal than the principal. And when, right. you, when you said this, I actually remember, and this will, um, this will kind of probably floor you. Um, I actually had my first interview for an assistant principal job. And I never, like, I didn't even want to be an assistant principal. I would, I don't even know why I applied. I think my te my principal at the time said, you should apply for this. And like, I think I got an interview because it was in the middle of summer and everyone was gone on vacation. And so they didn't see the hiring. So there was like probably uh -huh. like five people that applied. And so I just kind of got right. an interview by default. And so I had this um, interview with this gentleman named Archie Lillico. And he was, uh, he's someone I'm very close with now. But at the, at the interview, you know, we're like, Hey, nice to meet you. Blah, blah, blah. Five minutes in, we're like yelling at each other and wow. arguing and just going back and forth. Right. And he's mm -hmm. kind of getting under my skin. I'm obviously getting under his skin. And so I like walked out of there. I feel like I was sweating. <laughs> like it was just such right. a horrible experience. <laughs> and wow. I called my principal at the time. I said, that was like the worst interview ever. And she said, you know, Archie, I know him really well. I don't think it was as bad as you think it was. I'm like, it was just horrible. 
And so then he called me and it like, is like basically like, a, I'm like, here's the courtesy call. Like, thanks for applying. We decided to go with someone else. And they said, Hey, I, I actually, um, uh, I, I just want, I'm, I'm really glad, uh, that you had the time for the interview and I'd like to offer you the job. I was like, excuse me, you seriously want to um, offer you the job? Yeah. 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 And I said, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I didn't think we really hit it off. He said, the reason I want to hire you is you're the only one who challenged me on anything I said. And I actually mm. want someone who does that. I want someone who pushes me because at the end of the day, when we walk out of here, when we walk yeah. out of the office, like you're, it's actually, I'm the principal. So I have to make the final decision. If, if there's an issue with the decision, it's always going to fall back on me but I want to make sure that I hire someone who's going to challenge me and say like, you need to rethink this or do this. But when we walk out of that office together, we got to be on the same team. And he said, no one else challenged me. And, and I was like, I still don't know if I don't work with you. <laughs> Cause I <I'm> like, <laughs> but then he's like, and then he's like, no, you got to decide. And I said, okay, yeah, I'll take it. I'll take the job. And he shaped a lot of how I thought in that experience yeah. because he showed me the importance of, of not just having different perspectives, but acting upon them. Because I think a lot of times we say like, hey, it's really important that we have people that think different, but not if we don't do right. anything different because of it, right? Correct. And, and like, I'm sure that's, you know, in your career as you're talking, you know, how has that benefited you to like bring in those different perspectives, different voices and actually act, like how has that actually helped you in your work? It's, it's helped me immensely. Uh um, as you know, in school turnaround, and that's been pretty much the, the last eight, 12 years of my career has been in school turnaround and turnaround underperforming schools and failing schools. And what I've learned so much in that piece in school turnaround that it takes the village to, to move the needle, to move student achievement. And when you get people in the room um, and hear the diversity of thought processes and, 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 and all that, it, it creates a level of synergy that, you know, they can't be, un, they can't be denied. Um, and what comes of that is the national item process or, or framework that moves the needle for, for everyone in that building um, and, and also in the district as well too. So I've learned that also, the second thing that I've learned that if you're the smartest one in the room, it doesn't work. And that you have to surround yourself with people. And that's the thing about a, a good sign of intelligence. Um, and success and a recipe is for success is when you put other people around you that are, that are that are equally just as smart as you are smarter that can help bring these things to life and and bring the vision to life and bring the activities the goals to life and that's what helps you lead school turnaround school change and change paradigms mindset belief systems and attitudes that allows the the the, the, the company or the organization to flourish is when we're able to do that. And I've seen it work every single time for me. And um, being the, and sometimes as administrators, you know, we don't have to always be evaluative. We can be the thought, the thought tank partner. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes people just need a thought tank partner, not so much, and let me hear what you're trying to say and let me take that and let's create something. So let me help you think about some of the areas that you may have thought about and then, but it's your original thought. I'm just a thought tank partner to help push your thinking. Yeah, I, I actually, I smiled a little bit when you said about, <laughs> about the, the smartest person in the room. And, yeah. there, and it, I, I swear, I saw this just yesterday and I laughed. And it was someone, someone put a meme and it was said, like, if you're not, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. Yeah. And then under <laughs> it was like a disapproving look and it's like, kindergarten teachers right now <laughs> I thought so funny. it's like yeah you know that's probably it's that it's okay to be the smartest person in the room is when you're a kindergarten teacher <laughs> but I, I literally just saw that yesterday and so you said that I just because wow. I, I just I thought that was so funny when I saw it so so it's important for that except for maybe if you're the kindergarten teacher so like we'll just put a little asterisk on that the the uh, the 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 process the um the thought partner um thing that you said I think I think really one of the things you kind of alluded to it doesn't have to be an administrator too like if you're admin you're looking for that in different ways in the school and that that same year when I became an assistant principal I remember um, we had 
uh, we had a teacher on staff and she had a lot more experience in education than I did. Uh, she had been teaching for like maybe 20 plus years at that time. And I think I was maybe like 10 or 11 years of teaching and I was assistant principal. And on the first day I met her, we talked and I, like, this is not a good start for me. Like how I'm telling this, we started fighting. So like, I just got <laughs> over a fight with this principal who then yeah, hires me right. and, I, and I started fighting with this teacher. And I said, I'm like, I remember saying to my principal partner, I'm like, what's, what's up with her? And he's like, she's good. Trust me. She, she's good. Like he didn't know her, but he mm-hmm. knew of her reputation. And right. we started to like, actually get along, appreciate one another, but we always had different mm-hmm. viewpoints. And what I learned is that she actually had a ton of influence on the staff. And a lot of times when we talk about like the naysayer, um, we talk about a negative, but I think she had the same goals that I did. Yeah. But she looked at things different. And so when we'd actually say like, hey, we want to try this with staff. We want to try this new initiative. We want to do this. We would, I would always call her in my office and say like, hey, what do you think of this? Tell me. Because I knew she yeah. would tell me exactly what she thought. Like whether, mm-hmm. she, she didn't care if I liked her thoughts or not. She'd tell me exactly what she thought. And I would, I would actually say, okay, okay, I appreciate that. Thanks for telling me that. Tell, give me a week. So then she would, so I, I would, um, she'd go away. I would revamp what I said or what we were doing based on her feedback. And right. then I would call her back in and then say, Hey, so we did this different, this different, this different. What do you think now? She's like, I love it. And she, and she loved it because she saw her input in the mm-hmm. decision. Right. Correct. And so what's interesting is that this person who was a thorn in my side <laughs> at the beginning, when I became principal, right. she was my first hire as assistant principal. Like, and people, and you know, that's, I think people need to like hear that because we, we didn't always agree as a assistant principal principal, you know, we didn't always agree in those times, but she had different experiences. She had different wisdom. She, to be honest, you appealed to different members of the staff that I didn't appeal to and they would go to her and some would come to me. And I think that but I think the importance there is not just having people who think different, but you have to do things different as well. Like you have to, but as long as we're kind of going on the same page, like I'm not going to hire someone that hates children, <laughs> right? Like there's, there's absolutely, limits. Right, thinking right, absolutely. Different, right. So when you talk, when mm-hmm. you talk about this and you talk about like school turnaround, and I think um, that, that term, like, you know, I think people have a picture of it, but like when you go in, you know, you, you have an expertise in that, like, what are some of the things that you looked at, you know, for different schools that you worked with to help them kind of shift? And I, I think it's not like a lot of people think it's like shifting grades, but it's, it's really, <laughs> right. Like that, that's the perception is like you go in, fix yeah. the grades and then you can kind of go on, but it's more than that. So like, how do you look at that process and like, what advice would you give to people that, you know, maybe are in a, a struggling space? Yes, I think one of the things you look at from all aspects of the school is, you know, you're looking at a climate and culture because you're, you're trying to push sustainable system and processes that's going to carry the school even when you leave. And so you want the, the school to continue to flourish and be a success. You're looking at accountability. You're looking at the overall health, uh, financial and um, the organizational from a back end office perspective. Um, any from, from student information systems, anything from uh, business office procedures. So you're looking at the whole piece. And so um, conducting a comprehensive needs assessment is always uh, best. And that's what we always do, I've always done, to kind of identify some of the areas and breakdowns and then begin to work the systems um, that's put in place for like accountability and student performance and um, working with teachers and professional development and working with administrators and how do we lead and cultivate this collaborative culture? Um, because when you're talking about school turnaround, it's not about an I, it's about a us and a we and the team because that's what moves the, the needle. Um, and then actually getting the buy-in from teachers, but not only just teachers, there's janitors, there's support staff, there is all of these essential stakeholders that are that are key to the organization's health and viability of that campus making it being successful. 
So taking all these various components and moving those in, in, with effective systems and processes to get to success, um, it, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot of work. It, it, it's, a, it's a lot. But just to know that it can be done. Mm. And for the individual out there who's listening and saying, hey, I'm in a situation to where it may look hopeless or it may look uh, even, uh, not, not hopeless, but look challenging, even in what we call virtual and remote learning right here and right now um, due to a pandemic. Um, but how we reinvent ourselves and how we reinvent ourselves through online learning and remote learning is very critical and key um, to education and reform of education. And so it can be done. Um, there are schools and you know, plenty of schools who are actually doing that piece. But it, it's a, it takes on a different mindset shift, a shift in mindset, a shift in moving the old paradigm and accepting the new paradigm. And I find that many educators uh, want to kind of continue in the old paradigm and not fully embrace the new paradigm in technology and how do we reinvent ourselves in online and remote teaching or a hybrid model of teaching? What does that look like? And how do I still provide the absolute best quality of instruction for, for my kids? And how do I struggle with these different you know, variables um, that looks to be beyond my scope or reach. But to know that once you begin to change in mindset and begin to look at it as an opportunity and not a threat, um, when you look at it a way of, of how to promote uh, the welfare of, of all kids and, and, and that piece, then I'll, you'll begin to see change because that builds an internal innate motivation to thrive. And what kids need most in this current situation is your enthusiasm, your enthusiasm to thrive in, in this pandemic and situation that we call ourselves in COVID-19 and, uh, and the educational place where we are today. And once we do that, then we can see definitely a momentum of change and students begin to excel academically and will continue to excel. Not to say that brick and mortar is not good. Brick and mortar has always been good and it'll always be with us. But I truly believe once we shift in mindset and, and move the old paradigm and embrace the new, um, we're able to see us still move the needle for student achievement and student success and campus success and organizational health success. Yeah, and like when you, when you talk about kind of revamping the systems, I, I, have, I have thoughts on this in the sense that like I worked at Central Office and some of the things that I saw that I thought were really interesting was I felt sometimes um, what I saw from Central Office actually piled more work onto teachers to justify the jobs at central office. Like, hey, we need you to do the survey. We need you to do this. We need you to do this. And it actually took more time away from teachers where what I really tried to be in my job was my job was to take as much off the plate as possible to make your lives easier to, to do that. And I think sometimes when we talk about the school turnaround and rethinking this, I think it's really rooted in creating like systems of trust, right? Cultures of trust. And mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you're familiar with like Covey speed of trust is one of my uh, favorite leadership mm -hmm. books. And there's this, there's this little analogy that I, I give all the time. And I think it's um, really, it, it seems kind of ridiculous because I don't see it as like really forward thinking teaching, but we had, um, you, I don't know, like if you refer to, you know, what smart, smart boards are, you know, they're, mm -hmm. So what we, I remember this process, right? So schools wouldn't buy smart boards for every classroom. They bought the portable smart board, right? And every teacher was going to use them the exact same amount of time, right? So that we're going to have a sign out sheet. It's going to be in this class for 40 minutes, this class 40 minutes, right? And then, wow. so it's portable. And then all of a sudden, a uh, teacher has it, some kid bumps it. And it's like, ah, now I got to like do this process over and over again. And some teachers are like, mm -hmm. No, nah, I, I don't have time for this. I, I'm and so what happened with those smart, those portable smart boards? They ended up in the same two teachers' classrooms all day. So if you wanted it, you knew sure. exactly where it was going to be. So the analogy that I when I talk about this is that we found when we mounted them on the wall, didn't have to 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 reconfigure them, then then we actually had more buy-in. Now I'm not saying like, hey, using smart boards is transform transformative uh, practice, but it's like people were willing to use them when you remove the barriers to make it easy, right? It's kind of like a, an IT department in a school district 
you know, doing everything to block teachers from using the internet and then wondering why people don't embrace technology. Well, because I don't want to, I don't have time to jump over 50 hurdles, uh, you know, that you're more secure than a bank uh, on how to get on the internet there too. And so I think part of that, when you're looking at turnaround, you have to start from a place of trust. Whereas I think a lot of times you hear the opposite. You hear, um, you hear kind of like we've, we've put this in place, this in place, this in place and feel teachers, you know, the, the grades might go up, but the morale might go down. And I think that's an important sure. element. And, and here, here's a question I've asked people, and I'm, I'm curious of your thoughts of this, uh, since this is really tied to your work. I, I believe that one person can go into an organization and totally change the culture and, and, you know, bring some different ideas, get people excited, change the structures of like what we're doing. I, I truly believe now, like that person has to bring people on board, right? It's not like a one person job, but that vision and connection. And you said something that I've, I've always struggled with in the sense that when I leave, the culture will continue. I also believe one person could come in and destroy a culture too, right? That's and, true. And so how, like when you, when you would leave those places, how do you ensure that maybe the person following in someone's footsteps maintain, I don't know, maintain the culture? Because I think that every person coming in should bring in positives, right? Like the next person mm-hmm. coming in after you brings certain positive things too. But I think sometimes they, the whole culture is shifted towards a totally different direction as opposed to it's built upon what's already there. So how do you, like when you right. look at that, because now you're, you know, you're not a principal, you're not a system principal, you're kind of working with them from what I understand. How, like mm-hmm. where does hiring in that process, you know, and making sure that the, you put the right fit. The right. Yeah, like what, how, how does that fall into that? Well, I will. I want to go back to this. Well, I will say that I do believe that one person can come in and shift the culture and change the culture for the absolute best and the most amazing world um, in education that can be done. When I when I talk about uh, changing the economy and culture, it's kind of putting in like systems that have not been done or not been put in place. So the systems and then the culture is wrapped up into the, the culture because I do believe culture is tied to the individual leading the campus. Um, and how that's going to evolve or not evolve. But um, as it relates to changing that piece is that uh, we try to do in the hiring practices is bring in somebody who has a mindset for change and a mindset who, who aligns to the vision that's currently already there, mm-hmm. but who can enhance it. Now, because each leader is different, right? And it may not look the same, but the same core values and beliefs about what we we're trying to achieve is the same. How you get there is going to be different. And I think for, and everybody's going to be able to navigate that pathway differently, right, wrong, or indifferent, you know, because they see it a little bit different. But the core fundamental pieces that are there should remain in place because those are the solid foundation that keeps the, keep it moving. Now, and how the person navigates those pieces and, and, and how that goes is up to the creativity of the individual that's coming in too. Because you want that person to be able to kind of flourish and, and come into their own, right? You don't want to be a replica of someone else. You want them to be them, their true authentic self and how they lead. Um, and so you want them to be able to flourish and have that autonomy to, to move and do those pieces to ensure that, you know, they're growing and they're uh, cultivating uh, some paradigms and new paradigms and new ways of thinking as well too, to move it. It's just making sure that the core foundational pieces are in place. Yeah, like my my former superintendent, when I became a principal and she hired me, she said, when you leave this place, and I think it totally ties into what you're saying, I need to see that your fingerprints were here. Like I need to see yeah. elements of the work that you, your strength are here after you leave. And it didn't mean like you need to change everything about that culture, but I want to see little elements mm-hmm. of like who you are kind of in that space, because then you'll see, you know, if you're a, effective, um, you know, in that space. And so I, I think that to me is a, an important element. And so you, you have um, your, a book and we talked about it before the podcast, um, your graders mm-hmm. right now. And this is a book that is not just for educators, it's for anybody. So what's like the brief, like two minute 
what's the synopsis <laughs> of this book? I don't, I don't, I want people, to, I want people to buy it. So you can't give too much away. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Basically it is a book to help people fine tune and redefine and reach their purpose, their God given purpose. Um, it helps walk them on a pathway to identify the purpose um, it provides them an element to uh, take a deeper dive and critical reflection of self, um, not to be in fear, not to be in disbelief, not to not, not have hope, but it helps them to reaffirm their hope, their belief that they can walk into their calling. Um, they can reach the goal. So whatever that goal is or whatever that calling is, they can. It, the book walks them through seven chapters of how to do that. One being chapter one and defining it, Chapters two, three, four, and five, and six walk alongside with activities, affirmations of that magnitude in chapter seven. Now it's your time. It's now you've been released to walk into your purpose. Okay. So when I hear, and purpose is like a really popular word right now. Like I've heard, mm -hmm. that, and maybe, and maybe it's popular right now because we've, no matter what, you've had to step back no matter what you do, yeah. right? No matter like as a human, as a educator, mm -hmm. whatever, right? But I think, and I, and I would love your thoughts on this. When we think mm -hmm. purpose, a lot of times I hear it and I hear it a lot tied to your job. And so when no. you, when you, so, and that's, and I, and I actually feel like a lot of my purpose, I would actually say at some point, I felt my purpose was totally tied to my career. And now I don't, I honestly don't feel that as much as I used to. I feel there's like being a dad is really important, you know, is, is very central to me. Um, you know, just, just things like that. So like when right. you, when you say purpose, like what, what do you, what's like, how is that connected to who I am as a human? What do you mean by that? So, and that connectivity of your purpose is a connectivity to what you define or what you see as successful right because success is not deemed by status quo by occupation job it's deemed by you the individual so when i talk about purpose and success i mean talk walking into so if your success or purpose is to be a, a better father a greater I, I, that's what i enjoy then you measure that success nobody can measure that success for you except you and nor can anyone define it for you but you and so this book takes that what your success is or purpose and helps you define that for you and, and helps you walk through. So I remember being caught up in like you, I was, I thought that my job, well, all the applause came from the accolades, came from my occupation, my job, what I did in schools. And, and that was, that made me a huge success by yet, but as a husband, as a father, I sucked, I failed. Uh, George, and I remember in the book I talk about, and I do give, you know, my own personal testimony and, and, and struggles along the way that I went through. I remember my son saying, Dad, you know what? I cannot stand to be around you because of your attitude. So, you know, I was having, yeah, yeah, like, really? So wow. you have been success in one area, but then lose it in another area of your life. And this book helps you to kind of find the even balance, pick up the low area that you've looked to say, hey, I want to be more successful as a father, as a mother, as a husband, as a brother, you know, and it walks you on that pathway to, to determine and identify that for yourself. And this is what this book does. So here's something that I've been talking about a lot for years, and I, I want your thoughts on this. So as you know, this, as the author of this book, really talking about finding your purpose, the importance of like defining your own success. And then in education, one of the things I really struggle with, with how the systems are set up is that we, as the adults tend to define what success is for our kids. Like we tend yeah. to say like, this is how we know we're a good school. Right. And we try to get our kids to this space. Right. And we share data and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, part of our job is to actually help kids not only um, find success, but more importantly, define it for themselves, right? And I think right now in our world, when you look at the the time that I grew up in and when I graduated, there is this perception that you were only successful if you went to post-secondary. Like that was the only way you'd find success, right? And I hope that has shifted, but I also see schools, you know, have their teachers all put where they went to uh, college on the doors, 
And I can kind of understand that, but I also feel like it's a, it's kind of a signal like, Hey, you got to go to college. Like it's part of that too. And I, I don't, I don't necessarily know that that's what I want for my own. I want my kids to find their own success. And so like, where, where is right. that, where is that balance of we, we have these goals that we have as schools that are sometimes defined by outside sources of, you know, of how we are good, but ensuring that we help kids find their own purpose, find their own success. How do we kind of find those balances between the two? Yeah, I think one of the things that as we look at education and kind of how reform is happening is that we are really coming to the grips that not everybody's going to move into post-secondary education. And so within that, we are preparing students to enter into the workforce um, we're preparing students to enter into community colleges or, or four-year institutions. But even in the workforce, it's making sure that our kids have uh, industry-based certifications that will allow them to go into the world of work, but it also increase their learning potential. One of the things that we understand is that the vocational certificates are amazing, mm -hmm. you know, uh, for the next trade, the trade, the trade vocation and vocational are good paying jobs and careers if they choose to do that, but just open them up to seeing exactly everything that, that's available. And then coaching and coaching those conversations with our, our students and making sure they understand the veracity of them and how they can engage in that piece. And one of the things that we're doing now is providing different job shadowing opportunities, right? Right. So you can get a chance to experience that career. You think, ah, I like that, but I thought I was going to like that, but no, nah, I don't like that <laughs> at all. You know, right. that's way too much. Right. But giving them, bringing in real world scenario, bringing in real world time as far as the job shattering, the mentoring opportunities um, so that kids can really see it in real time um, that will help to shape their their outlook and perspective of where they want to go. But to also, George, know that it can change too. It don't have to be etched in stone. Like I got to be this one thing for four years or that those things can change and how we interchangeably our, our plans, our graduation plans to ensure that we can change and shift to make sure we are maximizing um, students who are ready to embrace a world that they're ready for. So. So I, I love talking education with you, but uh, before we started talking, you told me you're a big Cowboys fan. Is that true? <laughs> yeah, I'm a fan. I'm a fan. I'm a fan. I'm a fan. Are you? Are you uh, I'm, so, so I'm a Bears fan. So like both of us have I'm had. Chicago Bears. Yes. Both of us have had horrible decades. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> so mm -hmm. so you uh. You know, living in Texas, are you are you really into football, or is it just you know just Cowboys? Like, is that is that a big thing uh, for you following Cowboys? Yeah, just you know, I'm not a big 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 football fan. Yeah. I just follow the Cowboys in that sense of you know, uh, they're winning, losing years, and just kind of things like that. I just I've never been really a, a, a big football fan, but that's been the team of my choice. So, okay. So outside of education, then what's like, what is, what is the thing that you love to do? Like, what's your, your, your hobby? What's, what's the thing that you love? One thing out of education is spending time with family. And, um, I've learned how I've had to learn how to be intentional in those moments, um, and really cultivating that piece for me. So outside of spending time with family, um, and the next thing has been my faith. So church. Yeah. And like, one and number two. That's, um, you know, one of the things that I've really learned and I'm, I'm trying to get better at it. And I think, you know, you, you alluded to it is when COVID happened, I was home, but it didn't mean I was present. Right. Yes. Very two mm -hmm. different, two different things. And so, uh, I, I really appreciate all the work that you do in education. I appreciate the stories that you shared. Um, the, the one about the kids cheering. <laughs> <laughs> I at first thought they were cheering yeah. for you, and then I'm like, "Oh, that's not good." No, it's the opposite. No, so they I, were I, not cheering for me, not at all. 
So I appreciate, I appreciate you taking the time. And so um, I, if you uh, connect with uh, Dr. Derek Love, his Instagram is in the uh, description down below. And you can also check out his new book. And so we're going to put a link to that as well. Dr. Derek, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to join us all today. Uh, I really appreciate all that you do and, and uh, love the work. And I know that uh, hopefully um, your words inspired uh, people listening as they have for me today. So thanks. And uh, I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you, sir. It has been an amazing time and our conversation has been great. And I'm humbled once again, honored to be on the show. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful day.